Well, hello, 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 everyone, and welcome to a new episode of He Said, He Said, He Said, a look at the world from a seasoned Black man's perspective. I'm your host, Alvin King, and welcome to another new show. And happy Good Friday um, to, to everyone, uh, whether you celebrate it or not. Um, I, it, is, it is Good Friday for many of us who are Christians. And um, I, Easter is also this Sunday, if, for those of you who didn't know. And, you know, I, I thought, you know, because, you know, we have our Christian friends on here like me, I just want to make sure that I share with everybody uh, what is Good Friday, you know, and it is a Christian holiday commemor commemorating the crucifixion of Jesus and his death at Calvary. And Easter marks the resurrection of Jesus three days after his death by crucifixion. So we are in a celebratory um, moment uh, right now, and I hope everyone is doing well today. Um, let me see, let me see, let me see. Oh, another piece of information for Easter. I, I don't know, I've always wondered, where did the Easter egg, what the egg, how did all that, you know, get, get you know, come into play? We're talking about, you know, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. Where did the egg come from? So did a little homework for those of you who don't know. Um, the egg represents new life and rebirth. And it's thought that this ancient custom was a part of Easter celebrations. But in the medieval period, eating eggs was forbidden during Lent. Um, that's 40 days before Easter. So on Easter Sunday, everybody just went for it and, you know, started eating eggs. I just thought I'd throw that little tidbit in them because I, for the life of me, I didn't, I would, don't know why people would carry eggs and stuff around uh, for uh, East, for Good Friday and Easter. Um, hello, hello, hello again. I'm just trying to look at my comment section to see who's in here and see who's um, uh, joining us tonight. But I'm going to go ahead with the show because we really have a good show for you tonight. Um, we are featuring our Manage Your Health series. And tonight it's about Black men and our mental health. Generally, Black men were always taught not to let uh, people see them suffering. So we hide it. We internalize it, and oftentimes we don't even talk about it. It comes from a long tradition of oppression, um, and 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 it's you know as a result of that we deal with a lot of anxiety and depression, which is often uh, misinterpreted in our community as a sign of weakness. Denial is really a defense mechanism and a way to hide all of that hurt. So tonight. Our discussion is about black men and mental health with Mark Tuggle. He's the author of Cultural Silence and Wounded Souls, Black Men Speak About Mental Health. Uh, Mark's intergenerational anthology is a collection of 30 brilliant men from diverse backgrounds sharing their personal experiences and professional views on a taboo subject from a unique racial lens. And we are so happy to have Mark with us tonight. I cannot wait to get into the conversation with him. Um, but in the meantime, hey, how you doing, Blue? Well, welcome to the show. In the meantime, you know, always, 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 I can't do this by myself. So it's time for me to get the guys in here. And I know they're somewhere around here. So if you all are ready, let's get on with the chat. Come out, come out from wherever you are. Oh, right. I was like, like that was an Easter egg. I should have found the things on my head. And Jesus. <laughs> Had you come on here with an Easter bonnet or an Easter egg, I was going to lose it tonight. <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> Hey y'all! Happy I mean, Good Friday to both happy, of you. Happy Good Friday as well. Ha I, happy, I, happy Good Friday. I think we found the Easter Bunny. We now know where those little eggs are coming from. But that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I have to tell you because you know, for the life of me, you know, if any, if I'm thinking about it, someone else is thinking about it. Yeah. And Easter eggs and crucifixion, they just don't. No, that's not a natural connection there. It's just not a natural connection. But no, um, no. have you guys had a great week? It's been a good week. It's been a busy week, but I, I went to a very, very good 
Good Friday service uh, with uh, my friend Michi, my cousin Angie, uh, so one of my boys, Brandon, Reverend Brandon Crawley, George Walker, a bunch of us were together uh, for a Good Friday service at Mount Enon uh, Baptist mm -hmm. Church, and it was a wonderful, wonderful service. Groovy, yeah. groovy. Well, you know, I was talking uh, on before we came, came on, and, you know, I come from a, a heavy church background, but COVID got in the way. Yeah. And I just, church just, I, I'm not celebrating Easter the way I'm used to celebrating Easter. And it's kind of, you know, I'm blaming COVID because, you know, it took us away from church two years. You know what I'm it's saying? A, a Basically. Change, yep. And so, you know, the change is kind of crazy. You know, hey, Monica, hey, Deborah or Deborah. Deborah's um, my Aunt Debbie. Okay. Hey, Aunt Debbie. Welcome yeah. to the show. <laughs> hey, Aunt Debbie. Well, you guys, you know, there is so there, there's, of course, there's so, so much in the news right now. And, and, and we're having a very serious, if the shooting in Nashville mm. a couple of weeks ago wasn't enough. Yes. This week, the Tennessee Republican led house mm -hmm. expelled two demographic, uh, Democratic lawmakers over gun reform protests mm -hmm. because they were using bullhorns, they said and was acting out of order. Uh, Justin Jones yep. and Justin Pearson, here they are right here. Yep. These are the two um, uh, Democratic members. lawmakers, mm -hmm. yep. you know, that, that got expelled. And, and there's also, there was a third person, Miss Gloria Johnson. Uh, she, here's the controversy, she's also a Democratic lawmaker with these two gentlemen, but they spared her. Yeah, she did not get expelled. She was reprimanded, as I understand it, but not expelled. She did not, you know. One of these things is not like the others. But she has come out to say that she believes that it was because of the color of her skin that she was not expelled mm. as well. But the message of all of this to me, the, my first thought was, did you ever, you know, when you look at these, uh, what do you call it, when, when, uh, when all the presidents, uh, Joe Biden just had one where um, he gives his speech, uh, the, state uh, of the, the, union. the State of the Union, and how people scream out, and how, yeah. you know, they, could you imagine if a controlled, whoever it was, the Senate or Congress decided that, you know, that person's out of order, we're just going to strip them down and expel them, and they're, 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 they're out. This is where that's going. And I just thought it was racism at its highest, highest level. Kamala Harris, is, uh, she um, kind of rerouted her travels and she's there now mm -hmm. to speak with, um, with uh, Justin and Justin. Yes. And um, yeah, and so I really hope that they, they get reinstated. This, oh my God, oh my God. I mean, if, if this to me hit me like, you know, seeing uh, the, the, the knee on George Floyd's neck or watching those folks scale the White House. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, the Capitol. It was, well, my, my emotions was just crazy. It's interesting you should mention that only because it was as the lawmakers were trying to justify their behavior in terms of expelling these two uh, uh, lawmakers, mm -hmm. they actually equated their protest on the floor to the January 6th insurrection. They were right. saying, well, it's, it's comparable. And that's why we moved as swiftly as we did. And I'm really struggling trying to see how lawmakers speaking up in defense of the constituents that they are there, they've been elected to serve, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is comparable mm -hmm. to people scaling the United States Capitol to overthrow an election. I don't understand the connection between the two. Right. There and is isn't one. They're just making it up just so they have some sort of justification for acting swiftly because they know people want some sort of justice for that. But they are just usurping that whole action and activity. They know that one of the Justins has been sort of raking them over the coals about past, you know, all this different legislation that they're trying yeah. to pass mm -hmm. and their positions on gun reform, et cetera. So this was just an opportunity for them to just get rid of him. Mm -hmm. I think he's mm -hmm. even quoted as saying that they all but called him an uppity Negro. Mm. Mm. Well, I did a little uh, fact checking 
And, you know, based on what they did Mm -hmm. compared to what some others have done in, (laughs) you know, in this um, in in, in Tennessee, a gentleman by the name of David Byrd and his acknowledged sexual assault on children. Yeah. Okay. Um, He was secretly recorded by one of the women and apologizing to her and to see that he's not. And he was what he wasn't expelled. No, no. But he was reelected also. Absolutely. Okay, he was reelected. And then, you know, one more person, this Paul, uh, this person, Paul Shirell, who just last month wanted to add lynching. Yes. Back in as a legal form of execution and nothing was done despite calls for action from the Black Caucus. But yet these two young black men were expelled for uh, standing yeah. up for what they believe and and using a bullhorn to do it. Yep. In the instant, like in the moment. It wasn't like they were like, well, let's take a recess and let's come back right. or let's think right. about this for a week or two. They were like, right now, let's get rid yep. of them right now. Right. Yep. Well, we, 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 will, we will keep them lifted. Uh, you know, that, that's all I can say. This, this is terrible. And Thank it's you. clearly not the end because no, the, it, the, it's the, not. the swelling of response to this is growing. And so I don't think this is the end of this story by any stretch of the imagination. And yeah. what does Blue say here? It doesn't matter when you have the power again. This is what the lack of voting does. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. We, we have it. to vote. We have to look at what people are doing when they've been elected. Right. And vote them out. Choose exactly. them out. If they are not representing the constituency, the population they have been elected to serve, then they don't need to be there. They have to go. I want to say All hey right. to my cousin Angie, who just uh, signed in to say hello as well. Hey, cousin Angie. <laughs> Your good girl, hey. Michi, logged hey, in. Hey, Michi. Michi's there. Yep. Hey. My hey, good Shannon. Friend Shannon logged in. Hey. Hey. Oh, Shannon, Thanks you made me running. dance. You made me dance. I'm going to tell you about that later. <laughs> she probably has steps too in doing that. <laughs> yes. She really likes the show. So the fact that, uh, you know, we get to say hello to her every week is really groovy. All right. Hello. Well, let me jump in real fast yes. to yes. some yes. other uh, stuff that's going on that really warrants our attention. Because, you know, we have been following this man and his wife since the insurrection because we have said that the roots and branches of the insurrection go deep and wide and there's corruption there. So finally, Come some on. reports have come up about uh, Justice Clarence Thomas mm. reporting doing some things that look improper, extremely improper, and some are calling for his impeachment. So he has reportedly been taking undisclosed luxury trips sponsored by real estate mogul Harlan Crow. Mm. Now, where wow. yeah. people get all upset and go, well, look, you can have friends, et cetera. Look, under judiciary policy guidelines, food, lodging, and entertainment can be received right. as personal hospitality uh, from any individual as long as it, it's, you know, it's doesn't need to be reported if it's from personal friends, right? You can right. all, all we right. can all have friends who right. want good stuff. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. if it is coming from an entity or a company, then there's an issue. You got to report it because it could be perceived mm-hmm. as bribes, et cetera. And right. you know, the transportation and mm-hmm. the lodging and the luxury trips that have been going on for decades that he has not reported mm-hmm. make him look bad. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. Arlen Crow has said, I've never asked you know, Judge Thomas for anything, but there have been a turn. lot of people at these events mm-hmm. where connections and, Absolutely. you know, Absolutely. It, again, mm-hmm. it just looks really, really improper. And the fact that there's a method by mm-hmm. which they are supposed to report these exact things and, and he it said, wasn't. nope, haven't done it, haven't done it. it, it it's, it's improper and it should have repercussions. Well, yeah. and not only that, Harlan Crow has also <laughs> created a foundation for which uh, Jenny Thomas is the executive director making a six figure salary. Hmm. So we are, we are of interest. In. Oh, can we say conflict of interest? Come on. Hmm. So, you know, it is an ethic violation, again, at the highest proportion. At the highest level. Mm -hmm. And he should be impeached. For many reasons, but this for, especially is for, for, for many reasons. For mm-hmm. yeah, I'm not gonna say the other, <laughs> yeah. the other yeah. eight, the other eight, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that 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 that's some hot news right there. Yes, it's a hot mm-hmm. mess. Mm-hmm. Now there mm-hmm. have been some other news on the uh, going in a slightly different direction. I don't know for those of you who have been following March Madness, but it was an extraordinary 
season of bracket breaking games that took place. Uh, a lot of Cinderella stories, uh, unexpected teams actually rising uh, to defeat uh, teams that were expected to win. The women's championship game in particular was an extraordinary game that I watched. But unfortunately, even though it was LSU's first uh, time winning the championship in the history of LSU, there was more focus on something that was going on during the game as opposed to the historic numbers and all of that of the game. So some of you may be familiar with Caitlin Clark, who plays for Iowa. She is arguably one of the finest NCAA uh, female players, very uh, likely to be the first round draft with the WNBA uh, coming up. But there was she was overshadowed in that final game, in that, in that final game, by LSU's Angel Reese. And part of the controversy was, you know, there was some trash talking going on between the young women as they were out there playing, as is very common in, in competitive sports. Uh, earlier in the week, Caitlin Clark was seen doing the, uh, the move, you know, you can't see me kind of move with the hand like I'm so fast you can't even see me move that was originated by John Cena of the, you know, the World Wrestling Federation. When she did it earlier in the week, apparently she was cited as being just competitive and just fierce competitor. During the game, Angel Reese, Caitlin Clark is white. Angel Reese is black also. Uh, Angel Reese does it to Caitlin Clark, and she is cited as being classless, you know, a poor sports person, you know, just, just goes in on it. Mm -hmm. Now, LSU goes on to win against Iowa. Again, as I said, 102 to 85. There's all this controversy going on between the two of them. Jill Biden, President Biden's wife, the first lady, uh, and the other thing that uh, Angel Reese was doing because uh, they, they were about to win was look at this finger because we're about to put a ring on it. So there's all this controversy about the two of them going back and forth as a means, I believe, of trying to just kind of like squelch it. Uh, Dr. Biden said, well, why don't we just invite both teams to the White House? Because, of course, you know, the championship team is always invited to, to the White House. Now, unfortunately, Angel Reese took offense to that because she was like, why are we now inviting the first runner-up team to the White House? Mm -hmm. um, and so she had made a public statement saying that she nor her teammates will be visiting the White House. If, if you're not going to treat us as the championship team mm -hmm. on our own mm -hmm. merit and mm -hmm. just placate to this the first runner-up team, mm -hmm. we're not going to come. Breaking news, literally right before we went on air, just thought I would check headlines just to make sure. And apparently Angel Reese and the team have decided that they will, in fact, visit the White House. And Angel was saying that she's a team player and she's willing to do what's in the best interest of the team. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that because put your big pants on, girl, because if you had told me that she was still talking about she wasn't going, I was going to have I personally had an issue with that. I was like, you need to grow up. Now, for principle, you know, I get some things you do for principle. But I thought this was something that you're going to stop. First of all, she got that kind of power. She can tell her whole team not to go. What is going on there? Uh, two things. One, the move was yes. done originally by Tony Yayo. Oh, Tony Yayo. I'm yeah. sorry. Yes. I, I, was yes. I, I was told that it was John Cena that way. But it's... Tony Ayo. Okay, got right. it. And even John Cena has come out and said, hey, 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 I didn't do that. Excellent. Thank you for that that very much. That was okay. done by Tony Ayo, and he needs to get the, the credit for that. Uh, secondly, I was supporting An you know, Angel to R the nines for not going to the White House. That was some deep <sighs> white girl crap that Dr. Biden decided to pull by inviting those girls who lost to come. When in the history of time have they invited the runner-up team? It's only because it was a predominantly black team that beat this predominantly white team and she wants to be all huggy and lovely. As mm -hmm. Angel said, she goes, if the shoes were reversed and they won and we didn't, we'd be sitting at Waffle House Picking our, you know, nails and trying to get some extra hash browns. So I would have said, "Screw you! Take your little thing and shove it," because we just gonna right. go and win another championship. 
Not quite sure how well, you feel about I, well, well, I think, well, you know what? I, I I agree with you. I agree with you before we move on that, yeah, Angel, she can do it. Stay home, girl. But why mm-hmm. should your whole team not go? I'm mm-hmm. with you. Stay home. Mm-hmm. If, if you value your principles that much, stay home. But don't put the other team, don't let them lose out because they feel different. Or, again, I don't, I don't think you have that. She got that kind of power. But I she got the whole gel guys. for the baby hair. She ain't. Oh, okay, okay, okay. You know what? Well, you know what? Well, you know, to, to round out our chat. <laughs> that's power. Round, okay, that's power. To round out our chat, ladies and gentlemen, look, one of the most recognizable queens of drag now has. Wait, are, you, are you skipping over me? Wait a minute. What? Oh, you know what? I did, Bobby. I did. And well, I want you to know this next piece of news is not the queen of drag. Go ahead, Bobby. <laughs> I was like, I was so excited to get my H. You, you, well, then you, like, thing then, going okay, here. well, you know, you go on because it's okay. an hour show. So you okay. just All go right. on. I will not be long. I will not be long. But I, did. <laughs> I had two beats like going from sports to education. And I I'm wanted, sorry, I mean, Bobby. I didn't mean to mess well, that up. I'm right. sorry. Before y'all jump in, I'm let sorry, me just boo. say that Rodney said that a pedestrian waiting for a bus would have <laughs> known did. that that was some dumb suggestion from Joe Biden. <laughs> Thank you, Rodney. Thank you, Rodney. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rodney. I, 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 yes. And I'm sorry to, to my bald brother, Bobby. I'm that's sorry. all right. Okay. All right. So on the education front, now going to another place that's very near and dear to my heart, as many of you know, I'm a very proud graduate of Howard University. And they have just recently made another very, very high profile hire there at the university. Uh, Stacey Abrams, who many of you know uh, for her extraordinary work around voting rights um, and her run for the governor's seat in, uh, in Georgia, uh, has been named an, uh, the inaugural Ronald Walters Endowed Chair for Race and Politics at the school. I actually had Ron Walters as a, a, a political science professor uh, while I was there at Howard. Um, and it is uh, it says that Abrams will be the inaugural Ronald Walters Endowed Chair for Race and Black Politics. And she expects to start uh, this multi-year appointment in September. And uh, Walter uh, Wayne Frederick, president of Howard University, said, we are entering an inflection point in American politics where the conversion of and the conversation around race and po- Black politics will be a central facet. Um, and he is very proud to add to this long list of hires since Wayne Frederick has been there, including ta Coates, the author, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, we all know from the 1619 Project, and Felicia Rashad, who serves as the dean of the Chadwick Boseman College of Fine Arts. Stacey Abrams is another jewel in the crown of high-profile hires at Howard University, making HU a premier educational experience. So with that, I'm going to say, Hate you and all my Howard graduates are going to say, you I know. Think you need to turn that light off on you because you got a light beaming Woo! on you right now. Okay. I think, okay. You, 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 you got a light beaming on you. Congratulations to, to Stacey, Stacey Abrams. Abrams. Come on. Now. And, and, you know, real quick, okay, I'm going to put my wig back on for this last piece because, you know, <laughs> it, with everything that's going on, people are in an uproar about, you know, this piece of news right here, which doesn't make sense to me, but the most recognizable queen of drag, ladies and gentlemen, RuPaul now has a, a RuPaul Build-A-Bear. Build-A-Bear. Okay. RuPaul Build-A-Bear. You know what I'm saying? I don't build know if you, all grew, <laughs> if you all grew up on, on Build-A-Bear, but... It is a big thing with kids, but you know what? With all that's going on about, you know, these cancel, you know, drag causes and all this kind of stuff, Rue, do what needs to be done, okay? And 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 make the bank. The bear sells for $64, and people are out here outraged that um, this stuffed animal, okay, and it is out here, and they are now protesting against, you know, build a bear that, you know, that they are promoting um, hate. And, you know, trying to turn their kids gay by uh, having a stuffed uh, drag queen doll. People are very, very upset about representation. And what they're doing is instead of just not saying anything about it and just letting it be, they are causing such a fuss that it's keeping it in the forefront and keeping it in the primary conversation. When in actuality, most people just want to keep moving. But with this, uh, these attempts to ban drag performers, they have just simply shaken the cage and yeah. rattled, well, the bear 
right. <laughs> even though you know, drag queens Come don't have very much hair on that. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> you have poked the bear. Come on. Yes. And, and all they're doing, I mean, you know, don't mess with the drag queen. What's in queen. that cup you're drinking? Which one, mine or yours? Uh, Vosh, with it, with oh, the okay. fun that he had going. Oh, okay. I was like, what is okay. he up there drinking? Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> you know what? Well, you know what? Poke, poking the bear is not a good thing, like you said, Vosh, for a drag queen. So, no. you guys, thank thank you guys for the chat tonight. Um, you know, we we had a lot to talk about, Absolutely. but we also have a show that we have put together for our manager health series, and we have a special guest here tonight. And if you all are ready. Yes. I'm ready to introduce him and bring him on the show. Are Let's you guys ready? On. Absolutely. Yes. All right. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, our special guest is a contemporary descendant of enslaved Africans. He is a same gender loving spiritual being with a strong sense of justice. He is an activist, brother, educator, friend, humanitarian, mentor, and writer who happens to live and play and work in the village of Harlem, ladies and gentlemen, in Manhattan, in New York. He has been featured in the New York Times and on BET with, uh, with Tavis Smiley. But tonight, he is on He Said, He Said, He Said Live to talk about his new book, Cultural Silence and Wounded Souls, Black Men Speak About Mental Health. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome author Mark Tuggle. Hello, hey, Mr. Mark. And Bobby, uh, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here with you guys. Thank you oh, so much for joining. Oh, thank you for, for being here tonight. Um, yeah. You know, uh, Mark and I has, act, has actually been talking, Vosh, since we had um, uh, 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 another author that we had on the show um, from, from New York. Uh, actually, um, and I, you know what? I hate, why did I just start talking about it? I didn't have his name right here. Isn't that something? <laughs> hey, Mark, welcome to the show, Mark. Okay. <laughs> Let's Welcome. just talk about Mark. Yeah, let's just talk about. Let's <laughs> we just talk about Mark. Let's talk about, let's so, Mark, <laughs> Mark, Mark, again, congratulations on your new book, uh, you. uh, "Cultural Silence and Wounded Souls: Black Men Speak About Mental Health." Before we get started, Mark, uh, take about sixty seconds in your words to tell our audience who is Mark Tuggle. Um, I'm 62 years old. Um, I was born and raised in the South Side of Chicago. Got three brothers and three sisters. I'm the fifth out of seven. Um, I'm single, no kids. I live alone. I'm happy. I'm passionate. I'm introspective. Um, I can be self-righteous at times. Um, I can be overbearing at times. Uh, but I have a kind heart and a warm spirit. And I'm happy to be here with you, lovely gentlemen. Wow. <laughs> Mark. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you so much, Mark. So <laughs> thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna kick off the first question tonight. Mark, what is the connection between mental health and self-worth? Wow, that is a really good question. Um, it's interesting because mental health, uh, when it comes to black men is so taboo. Mm. Uh, and you mentioned earlier the word, you mentioned de denial um, and, and feeling like, okay, I feel sad. Uh, that's considered to be a weakness. Um, so I know for myself, for a long time, I didn't know how to express myself emotionally. I didn't have emotional vocabulary. And so I had a lot of secrets, a lot of shame, and a lot of stigma. And it affected my sense of value and worth because I didn't talk about my mental health. I didn't have the, um, the language to express myself internally. And now that I do, I feel confident, I feel powerful, and I feel strong. Wow. Thank you. Well, well, Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank in you. that journey, first of all, let me just say, I mean, anytime we have anyone come on and talk about their own mental health journey, mm -hmm. I just want to mm -hmm. just let you know that we appreciate your openness and your Absolutely. honesty and your willingness Absolutely. to share vulnerability. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. So as we probe into your past to then celebrate your, your present yeah. and your future, what are some of the unhealthy messages that you learned about manhood in your past? Mm -hmm. uh, real man don't cry. Uh, men are supposed to be in control. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to handle your liquor and hold your women. Um, never let them see you sweat. Um, don't air your dirty laundry. Uh, keep it real. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of programming, a lot of programming. And um, that program is really rooted in heteronormative white supremacy, in my, my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, never feeling safe, being called a boy, 
particularly in the South, even in 2023, you're walking down the street and someone say, hey, boy, mm -hmm. you can be a 55 year old black man and a mm -hmm. professional, mm -hmm. you know, being called mm -hmm. the N word mm -hmm. by the cops, mm -hmm. um, by the receptionists. So there's a lot of unpacking, a lot of um, woundedness that we have to get through. You know, a lot of unlearning old ideas and attitudes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the receptionist? Like what receptionist? <laughs> Any receptionist. Go, just going, I, I remember going for a job <laughs> and I went to apply for a job um, and I was told that um, I couldn't, they would not hire me because, because of my hair. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? And right behind me is an Italian guy with a ponytail. He got the job. Mm. Wow. So mm -hmm. just my culture, you know, my culture attire, my hair was somehow a threat to the social establishment of this company, which I'm not going to name because I don't want to get sued on TV. No, don't do that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Do they have a jingle? Can you sing it? <laughs> I'm gonna ask you to not sip from that. He said, he said, he said, no, yeah, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm drinking that. Fiji water. I'm safe. Oh, it's not you. Yeah, it's okay. not you. I was talking to. Okay, okay. <laughs> I was talking to the one who just requested you to sing that jingle. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I, I want to ask, obviously, uh, for all of us, but as an educator, I am a firm believer that, you know, the first step of addressing a problem is understanding that problem, having a sense of really understanding the problem. And, and so in essence, in terms of your ability to address your mental health, can you share with us what work you had to do? You know, we often talk about put the work in, do the work in order to understand it. What was the process that you went through to have a better understanding of your issues and then how best to address them? Um, in December of 94, I was diagnosed HIV positive. And for months, I became obsessed with my own death. Mm -hmm. uh, a few months later, um, I saw a holistic health practitioner, and he diagnosed me with generalized anxiety disorder and moderate depression. And we never talked about it. But I had a friend who suggested that I um, seek out a therapist. Mm -hmm. And I thought a therapist was for rich, crazy white people. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, was, I wasn't going to go. But I was attracted to her spirit. And I, I made an appointment and I sat down with a therapist and we began to talk about not the HIV. We began to talk about the little boy, you mm. know, and how I felt on the inside when I was a child feeling um, alone, feeling betrayed, feeling disappointed, feeling unappreciated, uh, feeling shameful, feeling worthless. You know, mm -hmm. the, um, the trauma I went through physically mm -hmm. and sexual and verbal abuse that I experienced as a child. I got a chance to talk about that in a safe space where I was not judged, where I was heard, where I was seen. And I began to um, talk about those things that had hindered my, my spiritual growth and development. That's why I say there's a, there's a uh, connection between mental health and self-worth because for a long time, I never talked about how I felt about myself. Mm -hmm. We live in a society where people will, they want to know not how you're doing, but who you're doing. Amen. Well, right? amen. So amen. we're different in our community, you know. So I had to do a lot of work on therapy, um, join support groups, prayer, meditation, exercise, nutrition, um, yoga, acupuncture, a lot of journaling. Journaling was very, very, a very, very important tool for me to talk about, to write how I felt in the mm -hmm. course of the day, just to get it out of my head mm -hmm. and so I can look at it. Because once I see it on paper, it actually becomes real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank wow. You. Journey oh, wow. Yeah, you said what? It's an ongoing journey. Absolutely. Yeah. We are all yeah. works in progress, my brother. Yeah. Always. Yes. Yeah. But I'm a lot also, better than I was before. Thank you. Also, journaling, it doesn't just, uh, when you write it, it's real. It also sometimes writing it allows you to process it to let it go, to then yeah. give you space to, to have more things more positive things fill that void. So you're right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. And I, I am the king of journaling, uh, as, as we, we talk about all the time. So I know that to be very, very true. Um, Mark, you mentioned a couple of things that, that is formulating this question that I have for you. You talked about earlier expressing your feelings. You mentioned, you talked about your family. And so this question is about, my question is about, what did you learn in your family 
about expressing your feelings? Mm. I learned that feelings are a secret. Mm. And you don't talk about how you feel to anybody outside of these four walls. So I grew up with a lot of confusion and insecurity and resentment. We just never talked about feelings in my family, which is not uncommon for a black family right. across social economic right. lines. You know, right. my parents, their parents didn't model how to express themselves emotionally. And so a person can only give you what they have. Yeah, right. And they didn't talk about how they felt and neither did we. And that became the way I coped with life is to not talk about how I felt. So I would wear the mask of being in control, being confident, being self-assured. But on the inside, I was shaky and uh, I felt inadequate and inferior at times. And, you know, so I, I got some really horrible lessons growing up. Um, but talking to other people along the way, I found out that I was not unique. Right. Other people have had the same journey as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's well, typical. Yeah. Well, then along that journey, what were some of the most positive and supportive experiences that you had? Along the journey, uh, for me, um, I mean, like I said, therapy was helpful. Joining a support group, an HIV positive support group was very helpful to me. Um, and thank God now, because of social media, you know, I can reach out to people around the world and have those intimate conversations and, and talk about what's going on on the inside. So I have love and support in a community where I can talk to people about how I feel. They can talk to me about how they feel. And we learn how to express affection and intimacy and brotherhood and, um, and, and, and the spirit of unity is, is really important. You know, so, I, I, go ahead, Voss, I'm sorry. I was going to say, so it sounds like there was just this sense of belonging and having community that actually helped. Yes, very much so. That, mm -hmm. In fact, the sense of belonging is, for me, a spiritual need. Mm -hmm. I have a need to belong. I have a need to feel appreciated. I have a need to feel safe. I have a need to express myself in a creative way. I have a need to cultivate my spirit. And so part of the journey, like you mentioned, it really helped me to see what I needed to let go of and what I need to hold on to mm -hmm. and find out what my values are and try to live according to my spiritual values. And that's a daily challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just, I, I'm picking up some very, very good energy from, from you, Mark. Uh, wow. Um, and speaking of picking up some good energy, we're going to dive into some questions with you about the book mm -hmm. uh, because I have had the opportunity of reading this book. Ladies and gentlemen, it just came out in February. And um, uh, I'm going to tell you all who are watching, there's an opportunity for you to get a free copy of Mark's book. So stay, stay tuned and we will share that with you later. Um, but Mark, in your book, you immediately draw the reader into your book by sharing your own personal story, as you have done so with us tonight, and your detailed struggles with mental illness. Why did you choose, particularly, to open the book in this way? Well, I wanted to be transparent, and I wanted to be open. I wanted to be honest. I wanted to be vulnerable. And I wanted the people to know that I'm not just an editor, but I'm a human being, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with wounds and flaws and dreams and goals. And I wanted people to see who I really am on the inside, you know, not in the back of the book uh, through a bio, but through my own personal story. And hopefully there's somebody who can connect with what I've been through and it may inspire them to actually go talk to a therapist or talk to a counselor or talk to a social worker or talk to a pastor or talk to their best friend or just, you know, just say, I need somebody to talk to. Mm -hmm. And so that was really important for me. Mm. Well received. Mark, well early in the uh, book, you wrote an essay and you quoted David R. Williams. And, and the quote is, there is a vaccine for COVID-19, but there is not a vaccine for mental health. Can you share with us, in your own words, a little bit more about that quote? Well, um, I'm trying to remember where I actually got that from. <laughs> um, but for me, mental health is not a priority in our cultural landscape. Mm. I live in New York City. Uh, the mayor came out with this magnanimous budget, and he did include mental health in it. Um, but historically, mental health has not been a priority uh, in terms of caring for uh, people who are 
are underserved, people who are vulnerable. Um, and there really isn't the funding, there isn't the research, there really isn't the studies, there isn't the data, particularly when it comes to black men. You know, mm -hmm. our lives are not valued in, in, in the right. society. Mm -hmm. And so there's not a lot of discourse mm -hmm. about black men and mental health in today's society. And I want to try to be a part of a change of the guard so people can actually begin to think differently and critically about how mental health affects black men in America. Mm. Mm. Which really takes us into like the, the real crux of what your book is about, which is telling the life experiences of 30 black men dealing with and living with mental health. What was your approach for selecting these particular men to tell their stories? Most of the men that are in this book, I've never seen before. Mm. Thank God for social media. I, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And I would just pop into someone's DM and I would introduce myself briefly and ask them, would you like to contribute to an anthology? And I got a lot of indifference, a lot of apathy, a lot of rejection. Um, after a year, only two people were, were willing to write. Um, mm. And at one point, uh, my computer crashed. Mm. And I lost the whole book. Like it was poof. It was all gone. Wow. And I had to write the whole book all by myself, a day at a time. That sent me into a depression, you know. Yeah. So just constantly reaching out to people through social media. Um, you know, we live in a digital world where people don't like to use the phone the way we used to back in the day. I'm 62. And, um, and just being persistent, um, not giving up, being determined, being focused. And I find him with 30 men from all walks of life, advocates, clinicians, businessmen, educators, filmmakers, journalists, lawyers, musicians, that I thought would be a beautiful mosaic to share their stories. And here we are. <laughs> wow. And now you mentioned the range of, of uh, authors of the essays, that they come from various walks of life and different um, types of career paths. They even actually write their essays or offer their submissions in a variety of ways. Some are more of a poem, but some more uh, journalistic in, in their writing. Can you tell us uh, the significance for you of really having a broad cross-section of experiences and, and not necessarily um, those who all seem to have the, a very similar life experience? I didn't want to have an academic book um, and academia plays a huge role. It's important to have data, evidence, research, and science. I didn't want to just have a book about numbers. I wanted to have a book about nuance, about mm -hmm. layer, and about complexities. I wanted to have a personal perspective and a professional perspective because I believe that life is about balance. Mm -hmm. And so it was important for certain doctors to talk about statistics, but then other men to talk about their multiple attempts at suicide, mm -hmm. right? Because there's several guys who have written that they try to die by suicide, yeah. not commit suicide because the word commit implies that the person is somehow a criminal or they're immoral or they're unethical or they're somehow less than human for trying to end their life. And that's part of the stigma around mental health, the language that we use. We, I'm learning how to use a different language to uh, affirm the humanity of people who try to end their life for whatever reason. You never know what somebody is going through from moment to moment. Yep. So it's important to have compassion and empathy and tolerance and understanding. And I wanted to have that balance. And I hope that I was able to achieve that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Well, I, I have to say one of the one of the 30 men that's in your book is Tim M. West. And we recently had Tim M. West as a special guest on our show. Yes, so totally. I was very, very happy um, you know, Tim M. West is just an amazing soul. And to see him partnership with you in this book, it really meant a lot. And uh, I, I'm, I'm giving you kudos for all the work you did to get the 29 other men to, <laughs> to be a part of, of this book. Um, at the end of your book, Mark, you listed, uh, ladies and gentlemen, he lists, I mean, he listed authors and um, he, he, he had a list of uh, social media articles, resources, uh, helplines, hot, uh, hotlines. He has so, uh, um, contacts for social workers, therapists of, I mean, who you could contact. So this book is really a resource for all of us 
who know about or dealing with or know someone who is dealing with mental health, um, mental health issues. Mark, do me a favor and name two or three of your favorite contemporary black mental health advocates that you respect. Uh, one would be Renshawn Miller. Uh, another would be Dr. Ed Garns. And another one would be Philip J. Roundtree. Mm -hmm. And is there, are there any particular reasons why you chose these three? Because they speak truth to power. Mm. They're not afraid to be unapologetically black. Um, they're very black, black affirming, very culturally relevant. Um, they tackle some of the um, difficult issues of our day. Um, they are on social media regularly. And I look up to them because they inspire me to be more of an advocate with just the regular, ordinary people in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a few people in my neighborhood who I told them about the book and they told me they were so grateful because it's a much needed discussion in our community. And that mm -hmm. made me feel really good. Well, so, Mark, let me ask you that, you know, again, the, the, hearing what you've just said and still uh, kind of just focusing in my mind on the broad range of, of contributors that you have to the book. Um, it makes me wonder if you if you found generational differences among the black men um, in terms of their capacity or their approach to addressing mental health were the generational differences that you saw. There are generational differences and some of them are very subtle. Um, you know, somebody who's 20 may say, um, I want to keep it real. And someone who's 40 may say, um, I need to talk about what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. And so just <laughs> listening to how they express themselves yeah, yeah. is very, very um, poignant for me because I want to be able to understand their point of view and mm -hmm. not impose my thinking on how they express themselves. Mm -hmm. So there are some men who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, you know, people who are in academia world, they, they have a certain jargon. Mm -hmm. Then you have right. people who are speaking from their personal pain. Yes. Right? And then you have people who, um, who actually work in the field of mental health. You have therapists and social workers. And so they talk about clinical stuff. You mm -hmm. know, they talk about paranoid schizophrenia. That's not a word that you're going to hear in the neighborhood. Right, right, right. That's real. People hear right. voices and they talk about that. Do you right. feel that the younger generation, though, may be based upon some of the things you were talking about? We happen to be the same age. We're both 62. And, um, you know, thinking about some of the stigma that's associated with uh, support like therapy, therapists, et cetera. Do you find that the younger uh, black men that you spoke to seem to be a bit more open ar around receiving help in that way? <sighs> Therapy is still very much stigmatized, particularly amongst young black men, unless they see a young black man who's modeling that type of behavior. Mm -hmm. So if you talk to somebody who's 30, who's been in therapy for five years, and you're 19, you may be likely to even consider the possibility of seeing somebody. But if you don't know anybody in your family or your neighborhood, you're probably not going to be open to the possibility that th this may be a helpful resource. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So younger people may be more willing to, to, to join a support group, right? Because even though they may not want to go to therapy, black men historically have had therapeutic conversations. Absolutely. Right? Oh, you know, right. We oh. talk in the barbershop. I was going to say the barbershop is one. Well. <laughs> okay. The locker room, yeah. in the backseat of a car, mm -hmm. you know, in grandma's kitchen, Absolutely. on the front porch, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, at uh, faith-based ceremonies. You know, yeah. we've had historical therapeutic conversations, but we don't think of it as clinical. Therapy. Right. You know, I went right. to see a professional. Yep. And, you know, this whole idea about if I go see a professional, I must be crazy. That affects our sense of manhood. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. we have to destigmatize the language that we use when we talk about mental health so people will feel like it's a place where they can go and okay. actually be real. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I love that. Mm -hmm. How might anti-homosexual bias, whether internal or external, impact one's spiritual growth? Hmm. Wow. Wow. Okay, how much time do we have for that one, Bosh? <laughs> <laughs> Just a moment, because I always have a follow-up question. It's a, no, no, that, that's a great question. <laughs> Honestly, and I've thought this for many years, I really think that there is a conflict between sexuality and spirituality. And 
for people in the black community who attend a church or mosque or synagogue or temple, and the person who addresses them does not affirm your orientation, your identity, your preference. I have friends that still go to those places mm -hmm. and they are miserable. Mm -hmm. They don't have the courage to go someplace else because they feel like they're betraying God if they leave the church or the mosque or the synagogue or the temple. Mm -hmm. And so when you're constantly told about Adam and Eve and not Adam and Steve, right? And you're told about um, the sin or the sinner, um, there's just so much bias that we get, you know? I mean, when's the last time you saw two black men loving each other in a movie that didn't have a white partner, right? right? Um, well, there's a lot of anti-homosexual bias. It's, it's all throughout society. And it's men like us who have the opportunity on, on a platform like this to have these conversations that may be awkward and uncomfortable to kind of get to the root of it. So mm -hmm. we can, you know, talk about how we really feel about ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're bringing you back so we can expound on this. That, that's what we're going to do. I've, yeah. I've, already, I've, I've already made that up. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Vaj. <laughs> well, I am of the three. I am the not religious one. So... Uh, in terms of what you just said, there is a way, I don't think spirituality is in conflict with sexuality. I think it is the particular religion that people choose or the particular sect or the particular location that they choose to worship. But I do believe that those two things can work in, in cooperation with one another. Um, I agree. Because, yeah, I mean- No, I, I, I agree with you. Um, one of my favorite poets is by the name of Rumi. And Rumi says, I belong to no religion. Love is my religion. Every heart is my temple. Mm -hmm. So I don't follow a religious path. I have an eclectic approach to spirituality. Mm -hmm. But I do know people who are conflicted because of where they go to worship from mm -hmm. week to week. Mm -hmm. And they don't feel safe to talk about who they love, where they serve. I know that for a fact. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully when they watch us, they learn that there's <laughs> always a place where you can find your tribe. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I agree. I, I found my tribe. So you're right about that. Amen. Right Amen. Yeah. It takes well, courage, Josh, I think, to, to move on from where you've been. It does. And knowledge, knowing that there is a, a, a better space. And um, when love is your religion, you know that that will guide you to the right space. Well, you know, I... I oh, I'm sorry. Is is he talking? Did, did we lose Mark? No, he's right there. Oh, okay. No, I, I heard an echo in my uh, in, in, in my in my thing, and I th I thought we lost Mark's voice. Oh, well, here. No, okay, there you are. There you are. Okay. Um. <laughs> uh, so, um, before before we go on, because I know we're we're running out of time, I want to make sure that Bobby and Vos you know, get your, you know, because we, we came up with some really good questions for Mark. Yeah, I, I want to <laughs> I, I, I make sure that, um, you know, we have about uh, four minutes that we need to get in. So, Bobby, go ahead and, and get your question, and then we will, you know, kind of close okay. it out. Mm -hmm. So, so Mark, um, the book uh, offers a lot of examples of, of men who, uh, along their journey of self-care uh, around mental health, and so I was just wondering if you could give gener five basic, four or five general basic steps that a person should consider in experiencing their own journey of addressing their own mental health issues, what would those four or five steps be? Four or five basic, now when you say basic steps, do you mean like a basic tool? A basic tool, yeah. Okay, all right, um, prayer. Meditation, mm -hmm. uh, journaling, uh, laughter, and um, nature. Something okay. as simple as going for a walk could ease your mind, calm your confusion, you know, chill the rage for before before I curse somebody out. You know what I mean? I need to take that <laughs> that break so you know my rage doesn't become you know, resentment. Mark, we have never met before, but these two gentlemen can tell you that Bobby Edwards is known to do, like, I do what I refer to as my all walks, 
where I seek to be present and be in awe of those things around me. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I completely hear <laughs> the walking thing. Like, <laughs> it resonates with me. Absolutely. Good. That's Thank good. you. That's good. Well, Something that simple, right? That we kind of take for granted. Yeah, I mean, and 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 it 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 does help to free the mind, or you know, or you could take up potting. Like Vosh, and you could just, you know, cre- you know, plant plant flowers and name but, the flowers that give the flowers names, like Bush. yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yes. and, but and eat from them. <laughs> but well, Mark, it, it all did say free your mind, and the rest will follow. <laughs> Come on now, <laughs> that, that sounds like a song. Well, Mark, look, we we have gotten to the end of our show, Mark, and um, first of all, I would like to just give you this open invitation. Please come back. Thank you. Because because we have some some things I think we want to talk with you more about. Um, so I want to thank you for joining us tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Put your clicks together for <laughs> um, for our, our special guest tonight, Mr. Uh, Mark Tuggle, and uh, his his new book, Cultural Silence and Wounded Souls: Black Men Speak About Mental Health. And before Mark goes, like I said, ladies and gentlemen. You can win a copy of this book. We will have three copies that we will be giving to you. This is how you can get it. Listen up. First of all, you have to have subscribed to our YouTube page. He said, he said, he said live. If you subscribe and send an email to us at he said, he said, he said live at gmail.com. We can see both of them that will put you in line for winning one of Mark's books. And we will follow up with you to make sure we have your address so that we can mail this book to you. Again, you have to have subscribed to our YouTube page. He said, he said, he said, he said live. And also email us at he said, he said, he said live at gmail.com. All right. Did I get that right, Vosh? Yes, you did. And I wish I said, he said, he said, he said live just one more time. Just to Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to make sure you got it. Okay. Well, Mark, please, please don't go away because we're going to bring you back for our final goodbye. But... Ladies and gentlemen, please put your clicks together for Mr. Mark Toggle. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> do you guys have T-shirts? Oh, my goodness. We oh do. My go- <laughs> we, we do have T-shirts. We do. Would you like a T-shirt, Mark? I want a he said, he said, he said T-shirt. Okay, okay. Stay look, on. We'll get the size and everything later. So stay we'll, make sure, yeah. you'll, we'll make sure that you get a T-shirt and something <laughs> else, okay? <laughs> All right, Mark. Please don't go away. We're going we're gonna to bring you back. Yes, Courtney, we do. <laughs> Thank you. That's Thank you. hilarious. So, well, first of all, I just want to say that our good friend Judy, who's usually with us from Oakland, has hey, signed Judy. on as Mannequin Madness, which is her oh. business. And ah, she is the one who's been giving us all this love. She wished that it could life. go more, yeah. That the show yes. could be extended, yeah. Well, well Judy, Judy, Judy we, we're going to work on that. But, you know, um, we're going to work on that, Judy. Thank you so much. This, this was a great topic. And uh, we're so grateful to have uh, Mr. Togo with us today. But don't go away, Mark. We're, we're going to bring you back, okay? Don't don't go away. We bring. I mean, right, right back tonight. Right back. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, how did you like that? Wasn't that a great interview, guys? Yes, you guys? yes, 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 yes. Wow, 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 wow. Well, look, next week, you guys, you've asked for it, and we're going to bring it back. We are doing another series, Aging While Black, facing uh, reality this time, and we're bringing back some of the, he said, he said, live special guests, um, special guests who have been on the show. So next week, uh, we will have joining us um, Art, Dr. Art Fields uh, of the book, I Respect Difference. Mm-hmm. We will have Corey George here, certified clinical trauma specialist. All right. And, and we will have uh, Dr. Jamie Riley. He's the director of race and justice for the NAACP. They will be with us. The brothers will be with us talking to us about facing reality yes <laughs> okay black men facing reality okay and these brothers know how to tell you how they feel okay, okay. so right. you, you definitely want to tune in so for Thanks, this week Andy. ladies and gentlemen we, we we're, we're going to do something different for our um words of the week and uh we have uh seven rules of life Seven so rules of life. Why don't we start it off with uh mr bobby edwards absolutely the first rule that we want you to consider is Make peace with your past so it won't disturb your present. Indeed. Good one. And mine is extremely applicable tonight. What other people think of you is none of your business. So I'm going to drink out of my mug, Bobby. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> and, All right. And, and number three, with something very important to me, time heals almost everything. Give it time. Amen. In other words, relax. Right. Okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. the next number one. four. No one, absolutely no one, is in charge of your happiness except you. Yeah. So I'm going to drink out of my mug again, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't care what I think. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and number five, okay. don't compare your life to others and don't judge them. You have no idea what their journey is all about as I drink out of my mug, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know what your journey is all about. <laughs> number six, stop thinking too much. Mm. It's, all right. it's, all, it's all right not to know the answers to everything. Like what's in my mind. All right. Bobby. And number seven. <laughs> num number seven. No, number seven is one that speaks to my heart. Smile. You don't own all the problems of the world. <laughs> Those are our seven rules of life this week. Those are our seven rules of life, ladies and gentlemen. Look, yeah. So look, can we bring Mr. Mark Tuggle back to, to the stage uh, tonight? So again, Mark, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. I'm sorry. Thank you to Vosh and Bobby for making my world go round and my head and my hair and all that too. Okay. Hey. All that. With Thank the you. Hair back and forth. Uh, wait, Thank you. All, there's only one of us on here who can say with their hair back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. So ladies and gentlemen, you all have a great weekend, a great Easter. And again, once again, happy uh, Good Friday. We look forward to seeing you next week on a brand new episode of He Said... He said. He said. He, he said. said. <laughs> Take care, guys. Have a good week. Have Thank a great you. Week. Happy Easter, everybody. Peace, everyone.